nothing to do with machine learning, but it does have something to do with scientific data. So here we go. I'm John Corona at Unidata. Um, and here's everything you need to know in case you want to go to lunch now. Um, it's a data server. It's pure Java. uses Servlet and Spring to implement it. Um, and it specializes in earth and ocean science data, um, in particular meteorological data. And these are some of the file formats that we read and we output into both OGC, WMS, and WCS standards, <coughs> and also what we call community standards, which in our community is OpenDAP. And we've also developed some uh, specialized REST web services. Um, it's all open source, open development. We tried to put together a component architecture to allow third parties to plug in their stuff. Unidata is a program within the University Consortium for Atmospheric Research. That's part of um, that's in Boulder, Colorado. You might have heard of NCAR, which is our uh, sister organization. We're funded by the U.S. National Science Foundation, and we provide engineering support to earth science educators and researchers. Um, this is the size of our effort. We have about 25 people in our program and four FTEs on this project. There's our lovely mission statement. So we're famous sort of for three, we've been around for about 25 years. Um, it's little, we're probably unique within the NSF for being funded for engineering rather than research. And uh, this is what we're famous for. First of all, we've got a real-time data feed from the U.S. Weather Service, and we ship that off to, um, to basically universities who are teaching meteorology in graduate level courses and researchers who want real-time data. Here's some of the real-time data we have the weather prediction models from the National um, Weather Service pr Model Center, um, and, and satellite data, uh, real-time radar data, uh, lots of point observations. Um, all of that is data that the National Weather Service uses in their own forecast offices, and, they, and they've given us a feed, and we feed it out to, to uh, qualifying organizations. We also support visualization packages. Um, GEMPAC and Makaitis are, um, are old school visualization pra uh, packages <coughs> that used widely in weather prediction community. Um, the IDV integrated data viewer is our own from Unidata, and AWIPS2 is the new National Weather Service um, visualization, and uh, we're, we're working with that and seeing if we can use it to provide, uh, to, to support to our, to our community. And then the third thing we're famous for is the NetCDF file format. Um, which is basically a serialization or a storage format. Kind of think Fortran 77 and you get the data model. It's just multidimensional arrays, but we added these arbitrary key value metadata, which turned out to be uh, really a good idea. And, um, and we do it in a you know, machine independent, platform independent um, way. So it's portable across all kinds of architectures. This was a big advance in 1986. It's widely used in scientific data, particularly climate data. The, the IPCC, for example, puts all their data to do the model intercomparisons for the, for the big climate change um, exercise every five years. So um, this project started by uh, us deciding to do a pure Java implementation for reading and writing NetCDF files. And then we added the OpenDAP protocol to allow remote access so you can put data on a f somewhere else and read it. <coughs> from where your client is. This was also a very big advance in the, around the year 2000, at least in our community, to not have to have files local to their machine. At some point we realized that what was really important in all this was the API. So we've got a single API in which you can access both NetCDF and OpenDAP files, more or less transparently. And, and so we started to add other files formats. And we ended up adding all the file formats that are important to our our community and a lot of others too. Um, so that includes um, the HDF5 family uh, and uh, the gri GRIB and um, is a special format in meteorology. Um, these are some other specialized ones. GRIB and buffer from the WMO are the big ones. These are all specialized. Uh, you may or may not have seen them before. The NEXRAD radar formats, other kinds of radar formats, satellite data whole bunch of miscellaneous data. And after we, you know, not after, but while we were doing that, we built basically an abstract data model 
um, by combining data models between NetCDF, OpenDAP, and HDF5. And this is, this is a, so an abstract data model is a really important way to think about how your data works. Um, everybody does that, they just maybe don't realize they're doing it. Um, they create an abstract data model, they, they either write it down or they don't write it down. Um, and so it's better to write it down. One way to think about what an abstract data model is, is what's an API? An API is a binding of that data model to a specific programming language. So once you've abstracted it to a data model, you can then start porting it to other, data, uh, other, pro other languages. So this data model became the basis for our next version of NetCDF4, which is a file format that we built on top of the HDF5 file format, gave us a lot of new capabilities. And uh, so we use the word CDM library sometimes um, as a <coughs> synonym for the NetCDF Java library because when you hear NetCDF Java, you think, oh, that's something for NetCDF. But in fact, it's we're, what we really, you think it's, it, oh, that's for NetCDF files. What it really is, it's the NetCDF API, the extended NetCDF API on top of a whole bunch of different file formats. And this library, the CDM library, is used in lots of Java applications. It's pure Java. So that gets us to the Threads data server in which the CDM library is one of the key components. And uh, here we've got a number of data services that people can access data. This is the IDD data feed. I mentioned that before. It's the, the real-time data coming from the, essentially from the weather service. And we bring it in in real time. We put it on disk and we serve it out through the Threads data server. Use the servlet containers. I'll show you a little bit about catalogs maybe. And you configure your stuff with a config catalog that tells the data server what to serve out. And the user sees a, a client version of that and that tells them what, what, what's available on the server. Uh, an important thing that we recognized eventually was that our, our older technology of which NetCDF API is an older technology and OpenDAP is another one, it's all indexed based data access. So, um, so here's, a, here's an example URL in which you're getting some data from, from an OpenDAP uh, endpoint. <coughs> and you use index space. So you're, you're basically slicing and subsetting multidimensional arrays. So the new better thing to do is to work in, in coordinate space. And f for example, the OGC WMS, WCS protocols work in coordinate space so the user doesn't have to understand the relationship of coordinate space. He can say what he wants. The server knows what that means and serves out the subset that he wants. Um, and so that's important. Um, another way to say the same thing is when you have a scientific data file, what have you got in that file? At the lowest level, you've got a bag of bytes and you can serve it out through FTP or HTTP. Um, if you think of it through uh, NetCDF or, or OpenDAP, what you've got is a collection of multidimensional arrays in that file. And then the third level, the best level to use, is when you imagine that what you've really got is a collection of objects in that file. And you can subset those objects um, in coordinate space. So give me the set of profiles which are in this bounding box, say, over Great Britain or something. So here's the architecture for the CDM. Um, here's all the different file formats. And they're, we call this a plug-in architecture. So each of these blue uh, things is a place where you can plug in your own third-party component. And what that means that you can plug it in is it means that you can write your own software and work with this system without touching our code. Um, you just have to understand what the APIs are and then you can drop it in and it all works. So here's the architecture. At the lowest level, we can access all these, all this, all these different kinds of data and make it available through the NetCDF API. That's the data access API. At the next level, we need, in order to, in, in order to do, the, do the coordinate system um, access, we need to build coordinate systems. So we need to understand what the georeferencing coordinate systems are of your scientific data. So there's a layer in which there's something which understands those. And if we don't have, if we can't understand your data, you can plug in your own coordinate system builder. And now you have an object which <coughs> knows about coordinate systems. And at the top, we then turn those into objects, um, which we call feature types, uh, more or less an analogy to the OGC feature type. 
um, architecture abstract model. So that's the general um, software architecture. You've got three different places you can talk to your data through, three different APIs essentially that build on top of each other. Okay, so Threads Data Server, it's a pluggable architecture, uses Spring 3.0 annotations, which means that, uh, again, you can drop in your web services that build on, that use this, use this framework without having to get permission from us to change our code or, or you know, branch the code or fork the code. Um, and CDM has also got this component. I've mentioned already ISPs, coordinate system builders, coordinate transforms, uh, feature, and uh, this is a new thing that we've been, uh, we're slowly moving this to this, uh, this Java UDL service provider means you just put a little metadata in your jar file, drop the jar file inside the war, and it, it, the class loader finds your, finds your components and automatically loads it. So we're pure Java, it's a downloadable war file. Um, these are, these are sort of the, the main components of a, of a server that's, that might be different than you might expect. So we created these things called threat, these catalogs, which are just XML documents. Um, and I'll show you them maybe if there's time. Um, but it's just a list of the data sets and their endpoints. It's not a, uh, it's not a search, it's not a search and query facility. It's really just the raw XML that describes what's on the server. It's intended to be ingested into search engines, which, um, which a number of search engines have done, including GeoPortal. Um, and it's a place to add metadata to your catalog, basically s to help the search, help search um, find these data sets. Then we create, uh, then we have a number of um, web services uh, and, and community standard web services. I'll go over those in a sec. We, specializes in, we specialize in these kind of data files. So, um, one important thing about earth science data files is that they don't look like 2D GIS data. They always have time. They often have vertical coordinates. The most complicated thing we've done are these six-dimensional forecast models. So these are numerical forecasts that are run like every six hours, every three hours, even every one hour. And they have a forecast dimension. So you've got two time dimensions. You've got the run time that the, for the model was run, and you've got the forecast hour at which it's run out to. So you've got three space, two time, and sometimes you also have an ensemble dimension. So you can have a, you know, you can have a six dimensional data set, and that doesn't fit into traditional GIS. They're often real time and they're uh, or changing, and or changing. Real time means they're changing. Real time just means the data is just constantly coming in. Changing just means that every so often you might get an update on this, and this happens a lot in real in Earth data. Um, one of the decisions we made long ago was that we weren't going to use a database. So someone says, why don't you use a database? And I guess one answer is, well, we're doing what you can do without a database. So if you need a database, great. That's a solved problem. We're working with uh, terabytes, sometimes petabytes of scientific data in which putting it in a database is not an option. So what can you do in that case? That's essentially the thread server. We're doing the best <laughs> we can do without a database. And a thing that allows you to do is modify and add metadata using uh, an NCM, using NCML, I'll show you that in a sec, and it lets you create virtual, virtual data sets uh, from collections of files. This is what I've been spending my uh, youth on. Here's an example of a Threads catalog. This is the XML. Um, okay, cool. Um, it's got an HTML view of that XML. Uh, this is from our Motherload catalog or Threads catalog at Unidata. Um, I was going to show you a live demo of this. I don't know if I have time. Um, and you drill down. It's a hierarchical. It's a hierarchy of of data sets, a virtual like a virtual file system of your data sets. You can just set it to the. You know, if you've got all your data sets on your disk, you can just point the thread server to the top of that, and it will just sh you know do all of them like that. Um, and then when you drill down into a specific data set, you see the various metadata that you've presumably added to it. And then you've got, in this case, you've got a whole bunch of different endpoints, possible ways of accessing that data set, including WCS and WMS. There's some more of that. Okay, so here's, um, here's what we have in web services. Um, you can do HTTP file transfer, meaning you can just 
see the data as a bag of bytes and transfer it to your machine. You can use OpenDAP, OpenDAP to get uh, index level access um, where you're basically subsetting multidimensional arrays. Um, we created this thing called the NetCDF subset service um, in which you can do coordinate level access and get back NetCDF files and a bunch of other formats too. It's a REST, you know, it's, a, it's like simplest possible REST API for doing that kind of stuff. And then we've got this, these standards, WMS and WCS. Uh, the WMS was created by John Blower at the University of Reading. Um, and it's a, it's a, yeah, so these, these three ones are all third-party plugins here. Um, we, we wrote a WCS server. Um, it's still back on 1.01. Um, and the reason is because our community doesn't use it much, so there's not a lot of pressure. Um, how am I doing on time? Okay. Uh, this is a brand new one, SOS. It's in prototype, um, so we're hoping to include that soon. And then it also has metadata services. I already showed you the threads catalogs, and it's also got uh, a, a service that was written by a, another third party um, in which it basically publishes the metadata, and that, that published XML metadata gets, can get sucked into search and discovery systems. Okay, so I'm just showing you a few of the unique things about the threads data server. There's a, you know, when you work with scientific data, you have a hard problem. Um, so here's a, here's a couple of technologies we've developed to solve some of those problems. Um, the NCML is a, just an XML representation of the metadata inside a NetCDF file. But the cool thing about it is that you can essentially wrap existing files and fix metadata that you, you know, you forgot to put some, some important information uh, or you, you, you can change the metadata in the file without rewriting the file. And, um, you can embed the NCML directly in the TDS catalog, so the TDS will serve that view of that file out as if you had rewritten the data. And the client doesn't know about the NCML. Here's, uh, here's some NCML that fixes, uh, fixes some data. So um, you've got a file. There's the name of the file. And uh, you've decided that you want to add this attribute, and you want to remove your password from it. And here's a variable who has a weird name, so you've given it a better name, and you've added a new unit to it. Or you, you've added a, 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 an attribute called units, which <coughs> correctly says what units it's in. So, you, so that's an example of changing and adding, um, modifying the metadata inside of an existing file. And then um, an example of changing something uh, using NCML inside of TDS. So a data set scan points to a certain location and scans all the data and all the subdirectories in that. So what this just did is it took every file that was under here and added this attribute, which um, is this particular one is actually useful. So, if, so uh, yeah, there's a, there's a funny story about that, but I don't think I'll tell it to you right now. So it's a way to manage your data, serve it out to your users, and fix things without, without having to rewrite the data. Uh, the last thing I want to show you is just um, uh, a new features that we've added in the last year or so. Um, this, is a, this, is a seg this is a piece that you could also put into your threads configuration catalog. And this particular one says, I'm going to take uh, Okay, this is defining a data set. Here's some metadata, metadata for that data set. It's giving it a URL. This is the URL path that, you'll, that the users will see that at. Um, it says that it's a GRIB1. It's, this is GRIB1 data. I'm going to use all the services that's defined up above. I'm not showing it here. All, the service name, all. So that's a, probably a list of a whole bunch of services. I wanted to add some documentation to it. Okay, so here's, here's where it gets powerful. So I'm going to take, in this directory, all the subdirectories, and I'm going to apply this regular expression to all the files in there, and that's going to be my collection. And I'm going to throw that collection of, this, in this case, GRIB records, I'm going to throw it into a bag, and then I'm going to figure out what the multidimensional, how to build it into a multidimensional NetCDF-like thing. And this is 
this is a hard thing to do right, um, and it's pretty powerful. And we're trying to we're, we're trying to scale this up to very large collections, um, which a lot of people have very large collections of things like GRIB files. Um, and, and then this line says, because um, it's a changing data set, when you start up the when you start up the TDS, go and scan this and build me this thing, and then. I forget what this says, but something like uh, at three in the morning, go and go and rescan it and build it again because maybe it changed. <coughs> and I'm also going to allow the user to send me a trigger to tell it when it's changed. So this handles changing data sets. This is a way to elegantly describe a large collection of data, turn it into a virtual data set, and we we can add arbitrary metadata to it. Yeah, thanks. Okay, in summary, um, we have a data server for meteorological and ocean data. Uh, it's really a back-end <laughs> component for a larger system. It's not a polished you know, data portal thing. It's really intended to be back-end. It's used a lot in large data centers in the U.S. and in, uh, around Europe. Um, it's essentially a data translator and a subsetter. Um, the data stays in the native format. We're not copying it into a database. Um, and we're scaling it to, working on scaling it to large collections, which of course is a continuing problem, continuing work. Um, the source is in GitHub. We have issue tracking in JIRA. We do annual training workshops and community supported, you know, answer what, how does this work? The community will help answer it and we answer it too. Um, and we use it to make the IDD data stream available, meaning that we eat our own dog food, which of course just means that you use the stuff that you produce to see if it actually works. Um, and I was going to click on this and show you some examples, but maybe we should just go to lunch. By the way, we're hiring. If anyone wants to move to Boulder, Colorado, let me know. It's a bit damp there, yes, and you may not have a driveway and uh, but uh, but it's a great place to live if you're, especially if you're like a bicyclist or a runner or something. Thank you very much, John. <laughs> now the next session starts in here in five minutes. Oh so my so God! If you want your lunch, you need to run. If you're coming for the